Hello, everybody. So excited to have you here. We are here for Thursdays with Friends, an online conversation on current issues. And uh, wow, aren't the issues current today? Uh, so grateful for uh, everyone uh, joining us. I hope you all had a chance to vote early or absentee or on November 3rd. And uh, now we're patiently waiting for the results of all the various vote counts. Our host today is Diane Randall, FCNL General Secretary, and her guest is Mirna Perez, the Director for Voting Rights and Elections at the Brennan Center. And uh, sorry, uh, that's the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law. We're also offering ASL interpretation today on Zoom. And uh, if you have any questions about that, you can feel free to send me a message uh, and I will answer your questions. Now here is Thursdays with Friends host, Diane Randall and our guest, Mirna Perez. Thanks a lot, Wesley, and welcome everyone. Um, not surprisingly, we've had an unprecedented interest in today's Thursdays with Friends and I am really thrilled that uh, Mirna Perez is with us today. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to all of you who are um, waiting with us. We knew that we would be in a period of needing to wait until every vote is counted. And we understand that that is happening now. And while we are all anxious for a resolution, um, we will wait because the people have a choice. It's clear, I think for most of us that these elections have really highlighted um, both the polarization and a racial divide, uh, an understanding of racism in our country. Whatever the results will be, we do know that not everyone will be pleased. And uh, we have work to do if we want to move forward in our country where equality is realized. So I wanna, without further ado, I wanna introduce Myrna and ask her to speak. And I wanna give her as much time as possible because she is very much in the thick of this. Um, she is Director for Voting Rights and Elections at the Brenner Center for Justice at New York East School of Law. And the Brennan Center was inspired by Justice William Brenner's devotion to core democratic freedoms. Their mission, which I love, is uh, to defend democracy, reform justice, and protect the Constitution. So you can see that um, this is a, an entity that is well uh, aligned with us now. Myrna is a multi awarded lawyer. She has a degree from Columbia University Law School, from Harvard Kennedy School. She was a presidential management fellow at the US Government Accountability Office. She's worked at a civil rights firm, Dana and Colfax in Washington, DC, and clerked for the Honorable Anita B. Brody of the US District Court of Eastern District of Pennsylvania, and Honorable Julio Fuentes of the US Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Uh, so Mirna, welcome. And I'm just gonna ask you if you can speak for a while about an ass your assessment of these elections, both the lead up to it and where we are now. And I just want, before you start, just to say, we will try to take questions, um, but I but we have 30 minutes total. So um, let's see how far we can go. And um, Mirna, welcome. And please tell us, where are we right now in this election cycle? Buenas tardes, good afternoon. I am Mirna Perez. Um, and uh, Diane left off an important, I think, part of my life, and that is I am also a believer. Um, and uh, much of my animate, much of the reason why I animate um, my work and why I do it is, uh, is my faith. And I'm always very grateful for the opportunity to talk to other believers, um, in part because it makes me feel whole and I don't have to do like the work that I do during the day and then uh, keeping myself spiritually nourished at the end. Um, and also because it, involve, it it allows me to have a little bit of indulgence to talk about things and frame yeah. things in the way of values that I've seen. Um, and I, I did want to talk about um, some lessons that I've learned from this particular election. And one of the things that inspired me was a lot of what I saw uh, Quaker values are, I think you all call them testimonies. And, um, you know, with a, with, a, with a request to be generous and charitable, because I'm sure I'm not going to quite get it right, because I come from a different faith tradition, 
I do think a lot of our lessons can be rooted in your in, in some of your testimonies. So I wanted to talk about what I think we have learned in this election um, and hope that I'm able to make some connections that resonate with you, um, not only on an intellectual level, but on a value level. So um, uh, I think the first thing that I think we it, uh, learn from this election is just like how powerful people are. Um, you know, we are having a lot of discussion about, you know, the president claiming to have won this state or, uh, you know, news sources calling this race. And I think what is being lost in all of that is like the people are speaking on this and it doesn't matter you know, what the president says he won or what news source counts calls this one or that one, it's, it's our votes and what that matters. And I think we were in the midst of really, really trying times where we're in a once in a century pandemic um, where lives have been really disrupted and so much, you know, threats of intimidation and violence and COVID fears and we had robocalls and deceptive practices and we just had a lot to deal with. Um, and yet the people showed up. We showed up and we spoke in a very clear voice, at least about the fact that we care about our democracy and that we believe in the right to vote and that we believe in the idea of uh, the vote being a piece of nonviolence and how we resolve our political differences and how we make um, political transitions. Um, and to me, that really connects with the idea of like integrity, um, both integrity in our systems and like to making sure that our different institutions of power center us, center the people that they're supposed to be able to serve, and also that they center us as individuals where we're all getting told, I think, from a bunch of different forces that sometimes we don't matter, but um, for us to have our own sense of self that... Um, Maybe we individually don't matter, but when we're coming together, we're very, very strong. And to believe in that sort of integrity. Um, so uh, don't uh, don't buy um, all of those folks who would try to undermine your beauty and your strength and your power, because I think we keep proving time and time again um, that that Americans matter and that people matter. Um, the second big lesson, I think, from this election is that we are making a very big strategic mistake if we expect the courts to save us. Um, I am a lawyer. Uh, I believe in the legal system. I love going into court. I love uh, that we have a way of uh, deciding these kinds of disputes. Um, but I think uh, we need to make sure that our courts are actually in a place where they are uh, speaking truth to power and putting barriers on limits and on abuses, and that they are um, uh, emphasizing the best of our values and protecting um, those among us that the law um, requires protecting. And I think um, people uh, have lost sight of the fact that courts are merely one of three different branches of government and that um, of all of them, courts tend to be the least majoritarian, right? They're the ones where, where humans uh, and different public and public opinion tends to matter the least. Um, and so I think folks are forgetting that we need to be doing like the work of uh, the heart uh, of public opinion um, rather than expecting there to be a, a, you know, a bad law that we can run to the courts to try and get help for. Like, I think the courts are important to be doing that role and, um, but they're not, uh, all I think that we should be doing. And I think we saw a lot of uh, cases across the country where the court record on protecting voting rights is mixed. Um, it's, it's mixed, um, you know, and, and so I think as it continues to be mixed, we need to make sure that we are working the other muscles that we have in our country um, to ensure that right to vote is being protected and revered and honored. Um, and that means looking to the political sphere that means demanding it from the executive, uh, and that's making sure that the people do it. Um, I think, uh, and, and I was thinking that that was connected to the idea of stewardship because um, we're not, uh, we have a responsibility to do to protect our own values. We can't just expect a court system to steward them. Like we have to do that too. Um, and then uh, onto the value of equality, I, I think to me, this co compels the idea of proactivity, right? Like our, our election system 
has been built on a system that purposely and intentionally excluded people for a very long time. And I think we can have a lot of discussion about whether or not it does that now, whether or not there's this purposeful discrimination, but like we're never going to undo it if we are not proactive. Um, I'm Catholic and um, before we go to church and uh, before our church service starts, we always say uh, the prayer of the penitent. And there's this line where we ask for forgiveness for things that we have done and things that we have left undone. And I would say that as Americans, we have left undone a whole lot of things when it comes to our elections. Um, and we saw that, like the field did a tremendous amount of things of increasing access. Like we saw incredible changes to our vote by mail system, to the way we count votes, um, to the public education that we do, to the voter engagement that we do. But that was playing catch up, right? We were, we were, we were catching up for things that we had not done in the past. And it is not lost on me that it took a bunch of, uh, that it took potentially large scale disenfranchisement of white people for us to sit and say, hey, are we including people as much as we want to? Um, one statistic that I often tell people, and it's not really a statistic as much as an anecdote, I have gotten asked more questions by reporters about voting rights for people who are housing insecure, for people that are homeless, for people that don't have houses in the last four weeks that I'd had in the entire 15 years I had been practicing law. And it's not like we went from being really great at it to all of a sudden really terrible at it. We've always been terrible at it, but what people started recognizing was that there were a lot of people going to be in this predicament that are usually not in this predicament and it wasn't appropriate to other them anymore or to act like they were fringe or to act like the numbers were too small. Um, and then people started waking up being like, wait a minute, this is like a population that's not being served. And I think people were starting to say, oh, that could be me or that could be someone I know or that could like it. And, and you know, on one hand, I'm glad that people are waking up. But on the other hand, this was something that was always a challenge for us and should have never been allowed to continue. And I'm hoping that we are all sitting around remembering that it's not just a democracy for most of us, it's a democracy for all of us. And if we are not committed to making sure that all of us are getting brought in, then I think we're going to have some challenge. And I think that's the equality part of it. Um, and then finally, with respect to the peace part of it, it is very clear to me that we are a nation divided, where there are people that just have different viewpoints and they have different values and they have different levels of compassion or empathy or ability to put themselves in somebody else's shoes or an ability to imagine a world in which they were in a less favored position. Um, and I think what that means is that we need to be doing the hard work of making the public case of why it is that we work better as a democracy when all of us are included and why we work better as a country when those that are the least of us are given the same sort of access. Um, because we didn't have like giant breakdowns, but it didn't go perfectly. Like I am convinced we had more evidence of like isolated or I don't even say isolated. I wanna say uncoordinated acts of intimidation or uncoordinated acts of threats. Um, you know, we didn't have the large scale proud boys network kind of working in concert with doing X, but we X or Y, but we had a lot of like random, improper, unwelcoming, intimidating uh, uh, acts that were very difficult. We had a lot of people who had official duties that had to get escorted out of polling places because they were abusing their systems. And so I, I think that that tells me is that we have not made the case enough um, that our democracy works best when it includes all of us and that it is like inappropriate to be trying to try and block people from the right to vote. So those are my four big lessons for, for this, this election season. Thank you, Mirna. And, and I apologize for not uh, introducing you as a, as a woman of faith, as a Christian. No, you don't need to apologize. <laughs> because that's how we met. I mean, that's how I first heard you was on a call with sojourners and you were so compelling about um, how your faith uh, drives you in this work. And, and I share that in the sense that it is 
And I think a lot of people on this call uh, who are Quakers, not everyone is, but many of them, we really, we really want to let our lives speak. And those testimonies that you spoke about are core to us. And so when we see, um, you know, we, we, are, we are all working on these issues on our personal lives, but we also know that we need to work on them in our political lives. And, and clearly um, allow, you know, the, 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 the issue of the, the inherent dignity of every single person, I know is a part of Catholic social teaching. We often talk about it as seeing that of God in every person, but I think those are similar concepts. And of course, I think they lead directly to the question of equality and, and what does that look like in our engagement with other people, but also what does that look like in our democracy? And so we're, we're really at the forefront of these. I wanna go directly to the last part that you were talking about because we have a lot of, a lot of Quakers and um, a lot of other people of faith have been very concerned about, um, about elect, potential election violence and these kind of incidents you talked about and whether those might change and, and what might happen. Uh, we don't know what the final vote count is, but I think people are still anticipating that we could see some kind of conflagration. And I guess I'm just interested in, in what your you know, ear to the ground is, is hearing and thinking about in regard to this. I tend to think that uh, there's not much we can do if people are determined to cause trouble other than we need to be ready for it. What I do think is important for folks to do is to figure out how you be a witness that de-escalates, right? Like, I mean, we're in a we're in a predicament where we want um, things to be as peaceable and as calm as possible. Um, and I, we need to remember that there are people who profit from the um, discord, and there are people who profit from the disruption, and there are people who profit um, from the hate. And we need to do our best to not get them any purchase for what they're trying to, to accomplish. I mean, I think, um, you know, some of our, some of our law enforcement um, apparatus will handle things well, some of them won't. Mm. Some of our uh, protests that were intended to be peaceful will degenerate or not. Um, some folks will have it in their heart and do things that they shouldn't be doing. I, I think in most circumstances, um, we need to be thinking about how we're going to be part of the solution, and rather rather than fretting about it, thinking about like if it, if, if we're if we're called to the situation, like how we're going to handle it, and what we are trying to tell everybody is to just make sure that you know how you're gonna be de-escalating rather than up the temperature. Um, and rather than going there, like presuming that there's going to be a problem, how are you going to spread the message of like, you know, peace, love and acceptance of results, even if you didn't like them? Yeah, thank you. There are a lot of people who um, are part of the, I think part of um, some uh, the Quaker meetings and churches who have actually participated in nonviolent uh, resistance training and, and other people, not just for this, but in other cases have been prepared to be peaceful um, interrupters, if they will, or a peaceful presence, maybe that's a better way to say it and be available. And so I do, uh, but I, what, I, what I'm also aware of is that that takes some discipline and some training, but it is a form of public opinion. And I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit more about public opinion as I was compelled by what you said too about, um, we shouldn't rely only on the courts. Of course, what we do at FCNL is uh, we really are um, believe that 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 the civic the, the civic engagement of individuals around the country is absolutely critical to the effective functioning of our government, and that people should stay involved with the elected officials after they're elected. And in fact, we have a lot of grassroots lobbying teams and grassroots individuals who are talking to their lawmakers all the time and uh, really looking to build. Um, build relationships so that they have an ongoing uh, dialogue. And we, we see that as very valuable and helpful. Um, we're clearly following the Voting Rights Act as one piece of legislation. And I guess I'm interested if you have in, you know, any, as you think about what could change in the coming year to really address the restoration of some of those rights, or I should say to uh, make it possible so that more people can vote without suppression. How, what, what, do you, what do you see as the necessary thing that Congress can do? Well, we want Congress to pass HR 1, which is for the People Act, and we want Congress to pass the Voting Rights Act, Advancement Act. Um, I think part of the capacity to do so will depend upon what the Senate looks like and who's in the White House. But I think um, we have to remember that change doesn't happen immediately. And even if 
expect anything to get done this particular legislative session, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be putting on the pressure and we shouldn't be making the public case. And, uh, and I think that that's super, super important. I think we need to, um, again, normalize the idea of it being the case that we want everybody voting, right? You know, and like that we want, uh, you know, our democracy works best when it includes all of us. It is un-American uh, to be discriminating against people because of their race. Um, having laws like the Voting Rights Advancement Act helps all of us and it helps our healthy democracy because they put brakes on people who are acting outside our norms and outside our values. But we're gonna have to, command and demand a political response to it, right? Like we, we can be saying, you know, I can say whatever I want. I can testify in Congress on behalf of the Voting Rights Act, you know, as many times as I want. Like if we don't have the political might and haven't made the public case to make the politicians know that they have to listen to us or they have to listen to their voters who want it, then I think we're not gonna get there. And I think that's the part that's missing. I think that there are too many people who have gotten too complacent about the Voting Rights Act and what it does. And I also think that there are too many people who've muddied the issue. And there have been a minority of like fringe racists who, um, who have made like uh, apocryphal and intellectually dishonest arguments that are getting some traction and give, providing frankly people cover to not um, support it. Out our values and to not yeah. honor the promise that this country made in the 15th Amendment that when you step into the ballot box, you'll be free from racial discrimination. We're getting some great questions. I want to I want to throw two at you that are very different, but also very structural. Um, should voting in the U.S. be compulsory as it is in other countries in the world? That's one question. The second question is, what about the Electoral College? Should there should there be some effort to uh, abolish it? Okay, and I, I always think it's funny when people ask me because these are like big <laughs> issues and like what I think doesn't actually matter more than what any of y'all think. Um, uh, I do think the idea of uh, compulsory voting is a bit, um, is a uh, wrong solution to a very real problem. Like if the problem is that we don't have enough people turning out, we need to ask the question, why is that? Is it because people aren't getting time off of work? Is it because politicians are so cheapening our democratic process that they don't feel like it's worth it? Is it because people are afraid to go to the polls? Is it because people are not registering? Um, I, I, I personally believe that non-voting can be a form of political speech because what you are really saying is that the system doesn't serve me enough for me to spend my time doing it or the system has left me behind or, you know, to, to the extent to which it's volitional. I think that that's what we're hearing. Like of all the things that I could, I mean, there's some people who are were suppressed, but I think some of the people that are not participating are deciding of all the really hard things they're trying to accomplish, um, you know, waiting in line to be dealing with a poll worker who's not going to remember you and is going to say bad things to you so that you can vote for politicians that don't inspire you. I think there is a form of political speech to that. So I would prefer to try and make it so that more people feel like their lives are connected to how we vote, then I would trying to change all the court systems to mm -hmm. make a constitutional amendment to get the political support behind making voting compulsory. Like, I feel like it's an, in to me, that's an inefficient way of getting at an, another problem we're trying to fix and it won't actually fix the problem. It'll just paper over it. Mm -hmm. With respect to the Electoral College, the Brennan Center has suggested that we abolish the Electoral College. The idea, and it's not quite an abolishment, but it's more like going along with the National Popular Vote Compact, thinking about what it um, does for us. Um, you know, it's the idea that our country should be um, uh, uh, electing who wins the popular vote. Um, I think. We need to think through what those implications are to make sure that this doesn't become like a tyranny of the majority and to make sure that there, um, you know, there aren't entire swaths of the country that are like just ignored because they don't have, um, you know, the kind of numbers. Um, but uh, but the, the Brennan Center position is the, the national popular vote interstate compact is where is, is a reform that we should be seriously considering. That's great. Well, one, one person just asked specifically about that. So helpful, helpful to know that. Um, so this is a uh, can, I, 
can see in the chat, there's an election day as a national holiday question. That's one of my favorite things to talk about because I do think that's one of those things where very well-meaning people don't always understand the implications. Um, national holidays only work generally for people that work in offices. Mm. Like, you have a service job. If you are a domestic employee, um, you don't get off. Um, and the big question to ask is if you are an office worker, like if you don't get paid hourly, like do you actually need a holiday to be able to vote the way mm. we, yeah. people who do get paid hourly and people who do um, generally have to work on Tuesdays? Um, and so I would just be really, really careful about making sure that this is not a solution and part of um, that advantages mainly to folks that are less disadvantaged as opposed to one that um, that uh, people who are very disadvantaged enjoy it. Like I think what we should we should be thinking about um, instead is to figure out how it is that we make it possible for employers to let off so that there's not such an economic hardship. What do we do about ride shares or child care? How do we make sure that we have large early voting period opportunities so that more people can vote? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do feel like the the you know election day as a holiday um, just doesn't serve um, the folks that have the hardest time getting off. Yeah, great, great response. So um, we're really almost at the end of our time. This is a fast half hour, so um, you've been terrific. But I want to ask you a question that got put into the chat that really asks perhaps more of you as a person of faith, um, but it relates to this work. And, and it's a question that I get a lot as well. Um, how do we talk to people and across the divide? How do we engage? And how do we do that even within our own faith communities, but certainly, you know, in our families and neighbors? I mean, there's, there's ample opportunity and yet it, many people find it extremely difficult to not just escalate to anger when they hear someone you know, supporting Trump, for example. So it, it, on this issue, let's, let's talk about it with regard to, you know, access to the ballot. And how do you talk to people who are different? Well, I don't start with the most controversial issue. I mean, I don't know what Quaker faith tradition is, but I believe that we are broken sinners and beautiful saints at the same time. And I feel like people are really, really complicated. And, um, you know, there are plenty of people that I think have really obnoxious viewpoints, really noxious viewpoints, really sinful viewpoints. There are plenty of people that have viewpoints that I think are so abhorrent that I actually think that changes how I think about that person, but I'm frankly not supposed to judge them. I'm supposed to restore them, right? Like I'm supposed to be um, a person that brings them and, and links them closer to God and um, lifts up the image of God that's in them so that they can see it in themselves. And so often when I am talking to people, and there are a lot of people in my life who do not share my political viewpoints, what I first do is try to shore up the things that we do agree on. I try to come at them with like, I'm not better or more morally superior than they are. I'm just as broken too. Um, and I think when there is some trust and some faith that you're not being judged, you're not being hated, then you find more things that you can agree on and you're able to establish and people are not so primed ready to just say no or to come back with the the you know the quick slogan and the like and i know that some people think that that is a bit cowardly because it's not calling people out and i have plenty of jobs and plenty part of my job involves calling people out but when i actually have like a person in front of me as opposed to a politician or an institution or a side you know if i want to move that person like I treat them as a beloved child of God, that it's my job to, to lift up their light, you know, to get them closer and connected with. And then I also, I play the long game. Like I play, mm, that's right. and so, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk to people about the hot button voting issue when you first meet them. I would talk to them about the things that you can agree with and then hope that little by little, you're able to come to their point of view. I mean, it's really funny because I, uh, I have so many people in my life that at one point we were much further away in terms of our political values than we are now. And I think it's because I didn't write them off. 
you know, and because I, I didn't, I didn't presume that they were terrible because we disagreed on something. And even if I thought it was like, even if I thought it was really hurtful, but I, you know, isn't that what sacrificial love is, <laughs> right? Like, to, you know, Indeed. Indeed. To love somebody else, we would do it. But like, you know, I just think it's, I think it's hard work. And I think that's what Christians have to do. Like, I, a, I'm sorry, I just, part of most of what my work in the faith community involves is figuring out how to get states to restore voting rights to people with criminal convictions in their past. And if I can say that some people who have committed horrible crimes, like sins in the eyes of God, like can be redeemed and restored, like, shouldn't I apply that thing to a politician that has a viewpoint that I don't like? You know, and, and again, some of it were playing a role, but if we're actually talking about talking to people, especially in your faith community, like I, I don't come at it. Like they're the same way that I talk to people playing a role like on TV. Yeah. Well, one of the, one of the posters that um, we have tried to, to, to uh, spread as much as possible it says, love thy neighbor, no exceptions. And of course, that's directly from the New Testament. And it is, I think, what you're talking about. It's the kind of sacrificial love, but um, agape love that we know is, is necessary if we're going to move change uh, and, and, and move hearts, moreover. Um, and that's a lot about what we're about. Um, Mirna, I want to thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your insights and for the work that you do at the Brennan Center and your leadership and your willingness to come on and, and be with FCNL on our Thursdays with Friends. I want to thank all of you who've been, who've been um, guests here. Uh, we have many people who are active with us as um, advocates who are, will be talking to your elected officials. Um, we have people who are donors to our organization and you all make a huge difference. So thank you for your civic engagement. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Bye.